Amen. They make it easy to preach up here, I'll just tell you. Uh, over, uh, over the last few weeks, we've been talking uh, about this series called The Comeback. The Comeback. And in the first week, we learned that, uh, that sometimes what we see as a setback is a setup for a comeback. And we learned that all of us have a comeback story. That we all have at some point fallen. At, we have all at some point fell short. We have all at some point gone through something. And God has set us all up for a comeback. We learned that God is the author of the comeback story. Amen. And then last week, uh, I hope you were here last week. And if you wouldn't, you should go back. Because I was encouraged and I was the one preaching. But what we learned is that our failure is not final. Our failure is not final. And I don't know about you, but I needed to know that. That our failure is not final. Sometimes when we fall, it seems permanent. Sometimes when we fall, it seems like it's the end of everything. But it does not have to be that way. Your failure is not final. And this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk about scars. We're going to talk about scars. And uh, before we do that, I want us to pray. And uh, you just pray for me, and I'll just pray for you, and everybody will get prayed for. How about that? So let's pray. Father, we, uh, we come to you this morning, and Lord, we, we want to praise your name. Father, you are worthy of our praise. You are the only one worthy of our praise and we thank you for your presence this morning because we know that uh, where the presence of the Lord is there is freedom and so right now this is a place of freedom. Father we thank you that in this moment that you're trying to tell us something. Father we thank you that in this moment you're trying to change our hearts and God I pray that your Holy Spirit would move on us in such a way that you could change our hearts, that, you, that we would allow you in to change the way we look at our situations and that you would change the way we see our past and that you would uh, change the way that we see the people around us, Father. Lord, we love you today and we need you. You just be sufficient where I'm insufficient. God, you be enough where I fall short. Lord, we love you and we thank you today. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. If you are a note taker today and you want a title for the message, the title for the message today is Show Your Scars. Show Your Scars. If you want to write that down, if you're taking notes, Show Your Scars. If you're not taking notes, that's still the title. Uh, as I was thinking about this idea of scars this week, it took me back to a, a simpler time in life, about fifth grade. And I run with a bunch of boys, and they were a little wild, but uh, they, uh, the thing that we always tried to do was we always tried to be the toughest one. And sometimes that meant um, a little bit of stretching the truth. And so what we would do sometimes is we'd start talking about our scars. Uh, and we'd show, you know, I wrecked a bicycle and done this one, and you know, the next person has to top that somehow. And so uh, sometimes we had to stretch the truth. And uh, one person would tell about that scar, and then the next person would tell about that scar. And eventually we'd get into outright lies. Um, but it was like a badge of honor. When you wrecked a bicycle, you thought, man, I hope that scars, because I want to show everybody that good scar. But uh, I guess things change when uh, you stop being a fifth grade boy and you move on a little farther in life because uh, scars go from being something that you're proud of, glad that you got um, a badge of honor, to kind of being a thing of shame. And when you get a little older and you have to tell uh, everybody about the scar that you got when you tried to jump a car with a bicycle, it don't sound as good when you're 25 as it did <laughs> when you were uh, 12 or 13 years old. But uh, there's something about scars. Uh, every scar has a story. Every scar has a story. And 
Uh, I have all kinds of scars on my hands and elsewhere, but I could tell you the story on just about every one of them. I uh, cut it with a sawzall, or I smashed it with a hammer, or whatever it was that uh, scars all over. But every scar has a story, but sometimes scars can be shameful. And so I want to define for us what a scar is this morning, and stay with me, I promise I'm going somewhere. Uh, the definition of a scar is this, according to Merriam-Webster, he says, uh, number one, it's a mark remaining after injured tissue has healed. A mark remaining after injured tissue has healed. Uh, number two, a mark left where something was previously attached. A mark left where something was previously attached. Number three, a mark or indentation resulting from damage or wear. So scars can come from uh, injury or a traumatic event. Scars can come from separation. And scars can come from damage or wear. And so I'm here not to talk to you about showing off your physical scars, but what I'm talking about today is all the scars that we acquire when we're going through life. Has anybody ever experienced some pain, some hurt, some separation? Uh, have you ever experienced some tough times in life? And has it ever left you scarred? Have you ever been through something so horrible that you didn't want to tell anybody, but you got damaged in the process? Have you ever been through something that has left you injured? Maybe it's a mental scar that you picked up along the way. Maybe it's an emotional scar that you've picked up along the way. Maybe it's a, a emotional or relational. Any, we can be scarred in so many ways, but what do we do with scars? If you're here this morning, and maybe you're new, maybe you're not, I want you to know that here in this church we all have scars. And so if you came this morning looking for a place to uh, bring you per your perfect little cute family and uh, that never fights and never has any issues and the kids never disobey and the parents never fight and uh, money never gets tied, if you're looking for a place for a family like that, this may not be the right place because here we have problems. Here we, ha we have things going on that... Um, that we don't understand all the time. There's people here with problems. In fact, all the people here have problems. The pastor may be the most problemed person here. We're a place of unperfect people. And all of us have scars to show for it. All of us have things in our life that we've been through. All of us have pain that we've been through. We're a church of people with problems. People with issues, we're real people here. We're real people here. And so, because we're not perfect, we're not, let me put it this way. The reason that we're here this morning is not because we think we're perfect. We're here today because we're not. And we realize we're not, but we know the one who is. And we desperately want to know him. And so, if you don't think you can be a part of church because you're not perfect, you found your church. You found your church because we are not perfect. We are not a perfect church. Everyone has scars. Everybody has pain. Everything, everybody has some things in our past that we're not exactly proud of. Could I get an Amen. What are we to do with these scars? What are we to do with the things in our life that we're not exactly proud of? What are we to do with the pain in our past? What are we to do with all of the hurt that we've been through? What are we supposed to do with all of that? What are we supposed to do with our scars? Do we just brush it under the rug? What do we do with our scars? Do we just hide them when we become a Christian? Do we just stop talking about our past when we become a believer? What do we do with all the scars that we've acquired over time? I want us to look at a passage of Scripture today. 
If you have your Bible, John uh, chapter 20, starting in verse 24. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in front of you that you're welcome to if you don't own one. Uh, John 20, starting in verse 24. I'll give you just a moment to get there. John records this in John 20, starting in verse 24. He says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. I want to take just a couple moments and explain to you the situation that Thomas is in here. And Thomas is, is one of Jesus' good friends. He's one of tw the twelve closest friends of Jesus. And he's walked and talked with Jesus for three and a half years now. And he's seen Jesus do some miraculous things. He's seen Jesus heal people, bring people back from the dead. He's seen him feed the 5,000 with enough food to fit in his hands. But in the last week when we pick up in the story, we see uh, Thomas has seen Jesus come into the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey and everybody in town was singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna, which means salvation has come. So they were saying, this man is the Messiah and he is our king. And then Thomas would watch Jesus wash the disciples' feet. He would see him break the bread on Passover night. He would see him betrayed by Judas and arrested. He would see him put on trial. And he would hear the very voices that had yelled, Hosanna, cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Then Thomas would see him beaten and mutilated beyond recognition. He would see him hung on a Roman cross and be buried in a borrowed tomb. In this week's time, you might say that Thomas has been on an emotional roller coaster. He's been through the ringer in this last week. And so, when he sees Jesus, I understand the doubt that he has. Everybody gives Thomas a bad rep for being doubting Thomas. But I believe that if me and you had been there, and we had heard after we had seen Jesus so brut brutally beaten and crucified, we would have had our own doubts. We would have had our own reservations about whether Jesus could come back from the grave or not. And so, Jesus appears to the other disciples and Thomas is not there. And, and they say, Thomas, we've seen Jesus. But Thomas doesn't believe him and he says, I don't believe you and until I see the marks in his hands and I can touch the marks and I can touch his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. That's strong language. I will not believe until I've seen him. Eight days later, the disciples have locked themselves in this upper room because they're scared to death of what might happen to them if anybody finds out where they are. 
and they're in this room and it's all locked up and the doors are locked and the windows are locked and all of a sudden Jesus walks through the door. He walks through the door and the first thing that Jesus says is peace be with you. Peace be with you. And he would have needed to say that to me because I probably would need CPR if I watched Jesus walk through the door that was locked. I probably might have come unglued if I had seen somebody walk through a locked door. But he looks at Thomas and he, just reading the story, you expect Jesus to say something to Thomas like, why do you doubt me so much? After all you've seen me do, you still don't believe Thomas? We expect Jesus to give Thomas a speech about faith and doubt. We expect Jesus to say, hey, Thomas, get it together, man. Get it together. I'm alive. But that's not what Jesus says to Thomas. That's not what he does. He looks at Thomas in that moment. And he says, if you need to touch me to believe, then touch me. If you need to feel the... The, the marks in my hands, then here you go, feel them. And if you need to touch the side where they pierced me with a spear, then go ahead and touch it. He's not mad at Thomas. He's ready to meet Thomas exactly where he was. Jesus gave Thomas the very thing that he needed to believe. Listen to this. This is important. It was Jesus' scars that moved Thomas from unbelief to belief. It was Jesus' scars that moved him from unbelief to belief. It wasn't the miracles that Thomas had seen him do. It wasn't the fact that Thomas just walk, watched him walk through a locked door. And it wasn't even that Jesus was standing right in front of him. It was the scars that moved him in to belief. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. So what does that mean for us today? What does this mean for us? Undoubtedly in a room this size, there's people in the room today who, who you have some doubts about God. You have some doubts about Jesus. You even have some doubts about coming to church. But, but you're here today anyway. Could I tell you, could I take some pressure off of you this morning and say that God is okay with your doubts? If you're starting out with doubts, that's okay. Because here's what I believe. I believe that doubt is the starting point for faith. Faith always starts with doubt. Because if you knew for sure, it would not require any faith. But that's not what we're talking about today. I could go that way, but we're not going to. But... What I want to tell you is that Jesus will meet you at your doubts. Jesus will meet you at your doubts. You have reservations about God. You have reservations about Jesus. He'll meet you right there. He is not mad at you. He is not upset at you. He wants to meet you exactly where you are. He will give you what you need to overcome doubt. He will give you what you need to overcome doubt. Jesus' willingness to show his scars, the things that had caused him so much pain, moved Thomas from unbelief to belief. Jesus was willing to show what had hurt him to move somebody from unbelief to belief. 
I believe that if you're here today, and at some point you've made a decision to follow Jesus, and that's many of us in this room, I believe that one of the most important things that you can be doing is showing your scars. Let me say that one more time. I believe that if at some point you've made a decision to follow Jesus, one of the most important things that you could do is to show your scars. And I say it just that way. I thought about titling this message, Share Your Story. But I knew that if I said, Share Your Story, it would be our natural tendency if we actually do what the preacher says when we start talking to somebody to glance over some things in our life. That when we start telling our story, we would skip over the painful parts of our story. And we could be telling somebody our story, but withholding the very thing that will change their life. And so, I titled this message, Show Your Scars, because I don't want you to simply tell your story. I want you to show the things that have hurt you. And I know that that's uncomfortable. I understand that that is not comfortable. But I believe as Christians, we're called to show the parts of our life that have been the most painful. That have been the most excruciating, the parts that maybe we find the most shameful. I believe that we're called to show our scars. The place where I find myself so many times, and I believe the place where you find yourself so many times, is I would tell my story, and I would show my scars, but that person will look differently at me. They'll think different of me, and what if everybody finds out what I used to do? I guess you all never done anything. Have you been there? If I tell my story, people will know the truth about me, and then they'll look differently at me. If I show my scars, if I show my pain, then everybody will know the truth. What if the part of your life that you're withholding from the people around you is the very thing that they need to have their lives changed by Jesus Christ? We think people will reject us when we tell them the truth. But what I've found to be true is that when you tell people the truth about your life and you show people your scars, you find a deeper friendship with those people. We're so willing to tell people about our success. We're so willing to tell people about all of the mission trips that we've gone on and we're so willing to tell people about how things are going at church and how long we've taught Sunday school and we're willing to tell everybody about uh, being on the praise team and we're willing to tell everybody uh, uh, about how things are going at church and uh, at the organization where you volunteer at. But, you know, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say, after I told them that I pastored a church, wow, I want to get saved. Nobody identifies with your success. Nobody identifies with your success, and nobody really wants to hear about it. But here's what I found out. People can relate to your pain. People can relate to your pain. Nobody relates to a person who says, you know, I was a, an atheist and then I, I made uh, $7.9 million and I was going down the road one Sunday morning in my Rolls Royce and I seen a church and I just decided that I was going to get saved. Nobody relates to that. Nobody wants to hear a story like that. If they get saved like that, that's great. But nobody relates to that. But when you say, let me tell you my story. I, was, I, I hit rock bottom. I was broke and my life was wrecked. I was addicted and I had no hope. People can begin to relate to your story. 
people can relate when you say, everything in my life fell apart. And when everything was gone and, and when all the things were pulled away and at the end of the day I found myself with nothing but Jesus and I found out he was enough. Amen. People can relate to that. Stop hiding the things that you've been through for a purpose. Did you know that those, that pain that you went through, it was not without a purpose. God had a plan. You went through that thing for a reason because some... One day, you were going to meet somebody who was going through the same thing, and they would need to hear that in the middle of that, God was faithful. Amen. Stop hiding the thing that God's given you for a purpose. When you share your story and when you share about the deepest pain and the darkest moments in your life, it gives people hope. Because if God was faithful in the middle of that for them, surely he'll be faithful for me. When you begin sharing your scars with people and they find out about what God's done in your life, they will believe that maybe, just maybe, if God done that for them, maybe he can do it for me. People will begin to say something like, Oh, God brought you out of an addiction to cocaine? I'm glad you shared that with me because I need him to do that in my life. Or, or he might say, God brought you through that divorce that you thought was going to end you. He brought you through that and he was faithful. I'm glad because my marriage is on the rocks and I need to know that no matter what happens, God is going to be faithful. Or maybe it's that, that, that you, mean, you mean God saved your marriage after all that happened? You, you mean after infidelity and all these things happened, God saved your marriage? Well, maybe there is hope for me. You're hiding these things in your life that can change people's lives. You were diagnosed with that disease and you still praised God? Really? Wow. Maybe there is something to this God you serve. Your child did all of that. And they done all of that and you still loved them. And you still forgave them. And God used your love to bring them back. Maybe there is hope for my son or daughter. You mean you lost your son or daughter? And you still trust God? In the middle of all that, you can still hang on to the cross? Maybe there is something to this. You mean God helped you through losing both your parents? You mean that through that you still trusted God in the deepest, darkest parts of your life? You could still hold on? Your pain is your platform. To lift high the name of Jesus. God didn't call us to walk around and tell about all the great things we've done. And when we meet somebody that's in pain, they don't need to hear, Oh, brother, I'll be praying for you. They need to hear, Hey, let me tell you what Jesus done for me. I don't know what he's got planned for you, but, but, but here's what happened in my life, and he got me through that, and he can get you through this. Amen. People in pain need to hear your story. Your scars are your sermons. Your scars are your sermons. You don't have to have the book of John memorized frontwards and backwards. You don't have to have a master's in theology to witness somebody. You just need to tell your story. You just need to say, hey, this is what he done in my life, and he can do the same in yours. Tell them about your pain. Tell them about your problems, and they will identify. I remember a couple years ago, there was a guy coming to church here, and uh, he's a young guy, and he came up to me one evening, and he said, you know, I'm an atheist, don't you? I said, yeah, I know. I know you are. And he said, well, you're a preacher, right? And I said, yeah, I am. 
And he said, aren't you going to try to convince me that God is real? I said, no. And he said, well, just tell me why you think God is real. And I told him, I looked him in the eyes and I said, listen. I can't give you a scientific equation to prove to you that God is real. And I can't give you uh, mathematics or scientific proof in any way, shape, or form to prove that God is real. But let me tell you this. He changed my life. He changed my life. I was this and now I'm this. He changed my life and I believe in him because of that. A couple weeks he came up to me. And he said, I've been thinking about what you told me. And I've decided to follow Jesus. I want him to change my life too. Your pain, your problems, your story is the thing that God wants to use to win people to himself. It's your pain and not your prominence that will draw people to God. Earlier in the book of John, in John 4, we find this story of the Samaritan woman. And Jesus leads the disciples into a town in Samaria. And to the Jews, Samaritans were worse than dogs. And the only thing worse than, uh, to the Jews than a Samaritan was a Samaritan woman. Jesus comes into the city and uh, he sits down at this well. And this woman comes up, a Samaritan woman. And... And they begin having a conversation. And it turns out that this woman was a woman with a bad reputation. She, uh, she had five failed marriages under her belt. And she was living with a guy that wasn't her husband. And Jesus changes her life. He makes her right where she was. And she runs off from Jesus. And, and this is what happens in John 4:39. It says, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. And so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. This woman didn't go out and she had no reputation to begin with other than a bad one. She didn't have John 3.16 memorized. She didn't have Romans 8 memorized or Ephesians 2. This woman walked out and she started telling everybody what had happened to her when she met Jesus. She started telling everybody, hey, I've met this man and, and I don't have it all figured out yet and I don't know all the answers yet, but I tell you, I, I, there's something different about me and there's something different about him and I think he might just even be the Savior of the world. And these people would have known this woman they would have criticized this woman. They would have ostracized this woman. But she goes in and begins showing her scars. And she begins telling her story. And people start believing. And people start trusting Jesus. And people start asking questions. Where can I find this man? And before long, the whole village has come to Christ to hear what he has to say. And it didn't start uh, with a church service it started with a woman telling her story it starts with a story the way Jesus intended for the gospel to spread from the very beginning was through our story you don't have to explain uh, all of the theological principles in the Bible to somebody you have to say hey Jesus changed my life. This is what I was. And this is what I am now. Nobody can deny your story. They didn't live with you. They didn't live as you. They don't know all that there is to know about you. And so they can't say, well, that's not how it happened. It's your story. Tell it. 
showing your scars and telling your story does three things. Number one, it keeps you humble. I believe that it's important for us to remember for ourselves what Jesus has done for us. I believe that it's important that we remember what he brought us out of. I believe that it's important that, that we look back and see how far God has brought us. I believe that if we would look back and see where God brought us out of, we wouldn't be so quick to judge those who are in where God brought us out of. It's so easy sometimes to see somebody who is still in the place where you used to be and look down on them. It's easy to look at them and say, oh, I wouldn't do it that way. When you just had 10 years earlier. Showing your scars keeps you humble. Number two, showing your scars and telling your story, it gives people hope. They say if he could do it for them, he can do it for me. When people see what God brought you out of, it will give them hope for their lives. It will cause them to believe that if Jesus done that in your life, that he can do it in theirs. Sharing your story, showing your scars, gives people hope. And number three, showing your scars and telling your story makes Jesus look better. Makes Jesus look better. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul was saying, when I look weak, Jesus looks strong. And so if I have to look weak to make Jesus look strong so that people can see how strong he is, he said, I'm in. If I have to go through some shame, if I have to go through uh, telling my story, if I have to relive some painful events in my life to tell my story, but it sh makes Jesus look good, Paul said, I'm in. I'm in for something like that. When we look weak, Jesus looks strong. Could I tell you this morning that I'm not here because I'm smart enough or strong enough or wise enough to be here. I'm here because the power of Jesus, the grace of Jesus was sufficient for my life. I'm not here on my own ability. And I'm not here on my own talent. I'm here because the grace Jesus has given me. And you know what? I had nothing to offer Jesus. I had absolutely nothing to offer Jesus. I was as bad a sinner as there has ever been. Nothing to offer spiritually bankrupt. Far from God and yet God still loved me. God sent his son to die for me, understanding that I had nothing to offer. I said, God sent his son to die for me, understanding that I had absolutely nothing to offer him. I had nothing, not a zero zilch to offer Jesus. I had nothing good to offer. The trade was in my favor. Jesus gave everything and I gave nothing. Jesus done everything and I done nothing. I was spiritually bankrupt. I could not do anything. It's not that I wouldn't have if I could have, but I couldn't do anything to save myself. I would have if I could have. 
I would have saved myself if I could have. But I could not and neither could you. Neither could you. But God, understanding how worthless I was, understanding how wicked I was, He died the death that I owed for. He paid my debt and He paid your debt. He took not just the cross, He took your cross. Take that in for a moment. He took your cross. Your punishment. Jesus should not have died on the cross. You should have. You should have. I should have. We should have. And you know what? Nobody was twisting his arm. Nobody had him in an arm bar. Love compelled him to save us. Love compelled him to save us. I was born and raised in church. I was saved when I was six years old and baptized shortly after. And for the next ten years of my life, I, I knew about God. And I feared God. I respected God. But I did not love Him. I knew Him, but I did not love Him. I didn't think of Him as a friend. I thought of Him as a dictator. And so growing up, if you could have described my life in one word, it would have been inconsistent. Inconsistent. I looked one way, but my heart was, my body was in church, but my heart was far away from God. I lived one way on Sunday and a totally different way the rest of the week. When I was around my family, I was just a good Christian boy, but when I was around everybody else, I did whatever I wanted to do. And so I, I grew up hearing about God, realizing there was a God, and, and even saying that He was my Savior. But just a few days after my 17th birthday, I went on a three-day retreat. And in those three days, I encountered a resurrected Savior. And no longer was my faith my parents' faith, but it was mine. And I fell in love with Jesus in those three days. And I found him to be a friend that was closer than a brother. And when I did that, he changed my life. He changed my life. Here, just four short years later, I'm leading the church that you attend. God is so good. He changed my life. He changed my life, and He can change yours. You may not think that He can. You may not believe that He can. But He can. I've seen Him do some amazing things in my life. Some amazing things. And He can do that in your life. Today, you can know Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord. But you can know him as a friend. You can know him as a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You can know him as the lover of your soul and the love of your life. You can know him that way today. He's not a far off God, a God in the distance, but he's God right here. God with us. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 that if we believe in our heart and that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess Him as Lord of our life, that we're saved. And so this morning, if you would, I want everybody in the house today, just bow your, bow your head and close your eyes. Uh, I want to pray for us.